Hello there, welcome to Rational Religion, where we make sense of spirituality. In this episode of Believe You Me, we're going to be talking politics, and as part of a two-part special on politics and economics. We're going to do politics first, then economics, because in order to have a good economic system, you need to set up a good political system. So, take it away, how are we going to get started? Well, I think we need to bear in mind the basic fundamentals and build it up from there. Mm -hmm. uh, from an Islamic perspective, in terms of politics and authority and rulers, the verses of the Quran is very clear in chapter 3 of the Quran. It talks about how all authority ultimately rests with God. God appoints whom he pleases and exalts whom he pleases and abases whom he pleases. And that God creates the circumstances. This is the meaning of this verse is that God creates the circumstances which people then use and take advantage of to rise themselves to positions of authority in, in worldly spheres. Yeah. And the point is that if you then use those conditions and those circumstances created by God to attain power, to attain rule, yeah. then you have taken a trust upon yourself. This is not you being independent and you having a sense of entitlement and you being the ultimate authority. It's something for which you will be answerable to God um, in the most extreme sense for, because in a sense you're acting as um, a representative. You've taken on yourself the role of a representative and some of God's attributes of authority, you're seeking to reflect them hmm. by being an a worldly authority amongst the people. And you will be setting laws and setting rules which will either make people's lives easier or harder. And it will either enable them to connect with God and to have happy, meaningful lives, or you can make their lives a misery. And that degree of power is, and that degree of responsibility is mind-blowing. Okay. And you mentioned this, mentioned this, uh, this concept of trust. Can you elaborate a bit on what that concept of trust is in Islam? Well, the concept... Why is it trust and not, I don't know, just, just authority? Or just, because, just rulership? Well, God has ultimate authority. Mm -hmm. And he has invested that... He has, he has commanded humanity uh, in the Quran in chapter 4, actually, the mm -hmm. very next chapter. And it talks about how God addresses mankind and says, O people... Uh, make over the trust to those who are best entitled to serve and best entitled and will, will, uh, will be able to serve in the best manner. And so God actually invests a degree of sovereignty or authority in the people because it tells the people that you have to appoint from amongst yourselves rulers who, will, um, who are best entitled to serve. And that's a very important point because it means that one authority is not a God-given right of any individual, of any family, and therefore the Quran clearly in this verse is saying that you know, hereditary kingship, as we now understand it, is not actually something which is promoted by Islam. Because hmm. it says that, O oh people, you should give over the trust of leadership to those who are best entitled to uh, wield it and, and will be able to serve your interests and serve the interests of humanity and serve the interests of justice and truth in the best way. And so, in actual fact, by calling it a trust, it means it's not divested to one person. It's a responsibility that actually God permits among mankind uh, as a reflection of his attribute of authority but it's one which the people by choosing a responsible leader themselves they also have a part and they also have a responsibility to choose those who are best mm. for them okay let's let's just want to summarize what we what we've learned so far so there are two verses of the Quran which we've been talking about so far the first one is one which says all, all sovereignty belongs to God he exalts and gives a sovereign and gives sovereignty over to whom he pleases and he debases whom he pleases. Yeah. Okay? And you've said that what that means is not that every single person who has authority is directly appointed by God, but rather when someone uses the circumstances and the laws which God has created in order to attain authority, he then has, or he or she then has responsibility unto the people and ultimately will be held responsible by God to use the authority in the best possible way for the welfare of the citizens at large. Yeah. So that's the first, that's the first overall concept of sovereignty and the, and the relationship between the, uh, the authorities and the, um, the subjects. The second thing, it seems like what you're saying then is that it's Or the citizens, we should say, not the subjects. Yeah, sure. Very PC. Um, no, yeah, that's correct, the citizens. The second thing which you're saying is that essentially the Quran, and this may be a bit of a surprise to a lot of our, um, our watchers, the Quran seems to, and it does, encapsulate and promote the best of democratic, um, of democratic systems. Yeah. Because it says, A, it defines uh, rulership as being a trust and not... Um, you well, know, not a right. And not a right. So it's a responsibility, not a right. Yeah. For which you'll be held accountable. And it says the people are the ones who are ultimately sovereign in a way. Absolutely. They then give over the trust yes. and they give this trust of authority unto others. 
and addressing the people, it says your criteria for whom you should elect and for whom you should give this trust over to are those who are best suited for it. Yeah. Those who will be best in, um, able to discharge that responsibility. Which yeah. means it's not saying have a look at their family, have a look at their wealth, yeah. have a look at their background, have a look at their job. All these superficial things that even today in advanced Western democracies we have. Yeah, it's basically a personality contest a lot of our, uh, our, yeah. a lot of our different elections, aren't they? Oh, I don't like him wearing this, I don't like him there. He's a bit scruffy, yeah. he doesn't sing the national anthem. We all know who that's <laughs> talking about, right? Okay. Yeah, it's about, it's about actually saying you need to look at personal qualities yes. at, in relation to the actual job that they're supposed to be doing, which is something we can all learn so much from. Yeah. All right, so we've said that the Quran requires those who are in authority to act with justice. But what is the meaning of justice? And what is the standard of justice that Islam asks of its of, of, of people in authority? So actually, it's, it's actually quite unambiguous how the Quran defines justice. Mm. In chapter 4, verse 136, it's very clear. And it links the concept of justice to truth. I'd just like to read that out to you. It's a, it's a very potent and a powerful verse. Um, in fact, Harvard Law School even you know said that this is one of the great... Um, verses of great uh, statements in history on what actually is the definition of justice. And it goes as follows. O ye who believe, be strict in observing justice, and be witnesses for God, even if it be against your own selves, or against your parents, or against your kindred. Whether he be rich or poor, God is more regardful of them both than you are. Therefore follow not your low desires, that you may be able to act equitably. And if you conceal the truth or evade it, then remember that God is well aware of what you do. And that's a really powerful statement because, mm. you know, it's all very well saying justice, 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 but what is it? Well, justice is actually related to truth and telling the truth and um, acknowledging the truth, even if it be against your own interests or against your parents' interests or against your family, your kindred. Yeah. Right? And that's the real standard of justice and how many people are willing to actually bear witness against their own selves and against their own interests. And I think that's a really important point, because if you look at all the disorder that we have in the world, it's because people aren't acting according to justice. People are only looking to their own interests, either personally or the at least at most the exclusively interests of their country yeah. um, to the detriment of other people's rights. And when you have people's rights being abused, when you have their resources being plundered, etc., purely for the for the interests of a, of, a, of a different group, then that will inevitably lead to disorder. So injustice leads to disorder. Well, because and justice it leads to hatred. Leads to peace. Yeah, yeah, because it leads to hatred. Yeah. And it leads to... A, a sense of hurt, which will always boil over, which will always cause... Yeah. which will result in revenge, vengeance, and that kind of business. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, justice is intimately linked to peace, yeah. and injustice is intimately linked to violence and disorder in the world. Yeah, both at a domestic le level and at an international level. Absolutely, we hear this phrase all the time, it's bandied around like it's uh, completely acceptable and fine. It's called national interest. You'll hear, hear politicians talking about it all the time. We're working in our national interest. Hmm. You know, it's in our national interest to go to that country and do this. It's in our national interest to support this particular theocratic regime. We're not going to mention any names, but everybody hmm. knows who we're talking about. It's in our national interest to sell them weapons. It's in our national interest to, do, uh, to be involved in this injustice and this injustice. Well, if we just put 80 people and put them in a room and we replace the word national interest with it's in my interest... Hmm. Would you like to meet those kinds of people and you just see the interaction between them? Oh, well, it's in my interest to do this, therefore I'm going to do that. Mm. What's that called? We call that selfishness. We call that egoism. We call that egotism. You know, That is not a good way to live your life at either an individual or indeed a national level. And I think it's a, it's a peculiar, peculiar irony of um, national interest that inevitably it tends not to be in the national interest. When people yes. justify um, <laughs> causing disorder abroad for national interest... It almost always comes back to haunt them. Oh yeah, so because the world is globalized, yeah. the world is internationalized. So when you uh, deprive the rights of others, when you trample upon their rights, and you, for your own financial interest, t it tends to be um, in in our world, then that will inevitably harm you, and it will certainly harm your people. So it's, I think, it's a, a beautiful way that, uh, from our perspective, Allah Taala, or God, God Almighty, has set up the world, is that if you act in according uh, in accordance to God's laws, if you act with justice, actually that will lead to the prosperity of all. Yeah. It will lead to your own domestic prosperity, it will lead to the prosperity of people abroad. And we'll see how that relates to economic peace, because economic disorder and economic policies and using them as a way to perpetuate injustice in the world is probably the most flagrant, mm. along with military, but in a way it's more insidious. This is almost the age of economic um, yeah. colonialism. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And, and actually, and we'll go through that in the next episode. Yeah, but I want, I want to briefly touch on one aspect of that here, because it's relevant to this. 
it is that a very good example of how actually creating uh, being just and creating prosperity everywhere is in your is in the na is in your own national interest. It's purely the fact that if you enrich people around the world, if you actually develop countries and you help them to develop themselves, then in an economic sense, you'll develop their markets. Your own countries and your own companies will be able to do better because there'll be more people with more money to spend. Yeah, right. Absolutely. So it's a, it's a, it's the way the world has been built is that if you act with justice, if you act with respect to people's rights in a good way, in a in a peaceful way, then everyone will benefit. Yeah. And if you don't, then you may get short term gain, but you will have long term loss. And in the next life, particularly in this, from a spiritual perspective, then you'll certainly have longer term loss. Yes, absolutely. And it's interesting that that verse of the Quran, it talks about justice and bearing witness and equity for the sake of God against your own self, your parents and your kindred. And then it immediately talks about wealth. It mm. says, whether he be rich or poor, God is more regardful of them both than you are. Mm. In other words, don't make, your, uh, don't make your decisions based upon whether somebody's rich or poor. Mm. Right? Don't make your decisions based upon uh, considerations of wealth. Because God is the one who actually provides for you and for them. Exactly, exactly. So that's, I think, a very neat explanation and, and tying together the fundamental principles of justice and truth. <laughs> very self-serving statement. <laughs> no, I mean of the Quran. I, I, mean, I mean of the Quran. I, mean of I the, think I did really well there. Uh, no, 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 no. I mean, the Quran has wrapped it up very nicely in a single principle almost yeah. and encapsulated all the key elements. Phenomenal verses. Yeah. Um, and, and just going back to the earlier verse we talked about, about the, the essence of democracy. It just it just has everything, doesn't it? Absolutely. It has. It says, "Oh, you people, you, the authority which you give to others is a trust. Um, give it to those who are best entitled to discharge that trust. Don't look at other considerations. And oh, you people in authority, act with justice." It then goes on to define justice as being related to um, truth and as causing peace. Um, so it's a a wonderful verse that encapsulates so much of politics. The world today has a huge amount to learn from it. Absolutely. Now, um, what is the what are the roles of government that are defined in the Holy Quran? So it's interesting because the first roles of government that were actually given uh, were actually encapsulated in the teachings of the Prophet Adam, according to the Quran, who was not the first man, according to the Quran, he was the first prophet of God. Right. So, so humans existed. Before oh, yeah, humans Adam. existed many, many times, many for many cycles, for many eras. Uh, but Adam was the first prophet of God for our age, as it were, our epoch, you could say. Hmm. And um, as such, he was given the revelation from God as to the basic civilizational order that he should seek to institute in society. So the verse uh, which, of the, which encapsulates the teaching given to the prophet Adam, which, to be perfectly honest, even in society of today, we haven't actually fulfilled, is in chapter 20, verses 118 to 120, uh, depending on the counting of the verses. And says that it was it is provided for you therein through the through the teaching of the prophet Adam that you will not hunger on the earth therein, nor will you be naked, nor will you thirst therein, nor will you be exposed to the sun. And so it provi it, it's, it's, it's a teaching which is saying that it is necessary to set up a social order and a social system hmm. which provides everybody with food, clothing, water, shelter. And these are things that we haven't actually even addressed. Hmm. 7,000, 6,000 years later, you know, with all of our technological innovations. And you know what? I'm sure that actually in the society that he actually produced in his lifetime, mm. he actually did achieve that, mm. right? Because prophets of God, they do achieve their purposes and they have, do achieve the purpose of their teaching, even if it's for a brief period of time. Yeah. And so we've actually somewhat, in some, to some extent, we've actually gone backwards. We regress. <laughs> so you're saying the prophet Adam, peace be upon him, was more advanced than Obama, than Trump, than Cameron, Theresa May. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah there's no question about that <laughs> because he that. because the society which uh, which he created in the society which islam exhorts us to create as the basics of civilization yeah is one in which all you people are fed and watered clothed and sheltered and yeah. that's still something we're not doing in fact we set up a political and economic order that means that make sure that doesn't happen uh neither in your own country but especially abroad yeah yeah absolutely because we have political order and economic order that base that base itself on the exploitation of uh of the poor yeah um, so again, even in this, even in this, and we'll talk about that in the next one. Yeah. So even even in the basic teachings given for the basis of your society, the level that we're supposed to reach hasn't yet been reached. There's a huge amount of work to do. Yeah. Um, going towards that. Yeah. So one thing that we've actually seen throughout the Muslim world in particular, which does definitely need to be addressed, is the fact that we've seen the, this Arab Spring that's occurred, and uh, many of the people of different countries have rebelled and they've you know thrown off their governments. And what we need to address is, and it, it was really promoted by the West at the time, it was like, oh, fantastic, they're rebelling against these autocratic regimes that we have 
you know, supported and funded for decades. Oh, oh, oh dear. Hmm, hmm. Anyway, getting back to the actual point, it was very much promoted as a great, great thing for freedom and democracy. And actually, the majority of the countries, in fact, the vast majority of the countries, except perhaps from, except Tunisia, perhaps, yeah, have been in v- unbelievable amounts of turmoil. Peace has not been established. Democracy has not been established. You know, you've had the, further future rebellions that have gone on, especially in Egypt. Hosni Mubarak was overthrown, and then you had the Muslim Brotherhood came in, and then they were overthrown, and then you had the military-style dictator who's now replaced them so again. So basically you get worse rulers, you get successional or, or worse circumstances for the people in their country. Absolutely, and we look at Syria and we see actually that it wasn't so much of a civil war that was brewing there. It was actually a, you know, externally funded jihadi operation funded by different world powers to but, but interesting promote the and foment the extremism and to foment the rebellion that was going on there. So... A real question, though, that I think will be affecting uh, a lot of people in, in the Muslim world as well as elsewhere is how does Islam teach us to act if you have a government which is not respecting your rights, which is oppressive in certain respect? Are you allowed to rise up and rebel against them and overthrow them? No, absolutely not. It's completely forbidden. And the way that the Arab Spring has played out has shown that actually that when that does happen and people do rebel, mm. it actually just leads to further disorder, further mayhem, further instability, further deaths, further injustice. Mm. Right. And so just because your leaders are not fulfilling your rights does not mean that you do not fulfill your rights as a citizen towards them. Mm. And the Prophet Muhammad was very clear on this in his statements mm. to his companions when they asked him, are we permitted to rebel against a government which does not give us our rights? And he said, look after your responsibilities, focus on your responsibilities. Right. And he said that as long as they maintain the prayer services, in other words, as long as you're permitted to worship God freely, you're not permitted to dis- disobey them. Mm. When you, they stop you from praying, Right? Then you're permitted to dis- disobey them in respect of praying. Right. You're permitted to go ahead and continue praying. Yeah. But if they even then force you and your life becomes unbearable in that city and in that country, then the Quran is absolutely clear. You have to leave the country. You still can't rebel. Right. And the Prophet Muhammad's own example was manifestly clear. There is no Muslim on earth that can say that he has been persecuted by their government yeah, more yeah. than the Meccans used to persecute the Prophet Muhammad. And if there was anybody who had any right to rebel against their country, it would have been him and his followers, mm. right? And yet he did not permit his community to rebel while they were in the city of Mecca, when they were Meccans. He told them instead to take two migrations to, to Abyssinia. There were two waves of migrations to Abyssinia where he said, in Abyssinia, the Christian king Nagus will give you freedom of religion mm. and you'll be able to worship God freely, right? And, then when, and he stayed in Mecca, mm. right? And then when it became intolerable for him in Mecca... He then migrated on the same night that an assassination attempt was carried out against him, or attempt was made against him, where the, all the tribal leaders got together assassins and entered into his home and tried to stab him in his bed. And they found that actually he wasn't in his bed. He had already left that very night because God had informed him to go that night. And then they tracked him across the desert, tens of trackers tra- tracking him for a massive bounty that had been placed on his head, 220 miles north across the desert to Medina. So there's absolutely no one in the Muslim world who could ever claim that they'd be more oppressed than he was. And yet he did not rebel. Yeah. Right? And the reason is, is very clear, because rebellion ultimately leads to greater strife and disorder in the world. Right? And the Prophet Muhammad, his own example, showed that what you do is you migrate to another country. If you're able to worship there freely, then do so. If that country then pursues you and continues to fight against you, then in that other country you are permitted to, uh, to use that government and lobby that government and ask that government to stand up for your rights in that other country where you're now being pursued. Mm. And the Prophet Muhammad, when he migrated to Medina, he set up the Charter of Medina, which was a, a very secular document, calling for the Jewish tribes of Medina and the pagan idolatrous tribes of Medina and the Muslim community of Medina to work together as a multi-religious, multi-ethnic nation, s- single city state, yeah. right? as a secular state, he said that in the document says to the Jewish people that your enemies will be our enemies, your synagogues will be preserved and they'll be maintained and you have full freedom of religion, right? And then the Meccan idolaters chased him across the desert, okay? And they sent a letter to the Medinite idolaters saying that if you do not hand over Muhammad to us, right, so that we can kill him and keep him and stop his movement, then we will come to your city and we will kill all of your men and enslave all of your women. And it is in that context that the, that the Quran then permitted Muslims to take up arms in self-defense. Mm. So rebellion is absolutely forbidden in Islam. And we can see from the Arab Spring why that happens. Because the great dream of democracy, well, it never materialized. All you got was disorder, strife and civil war all over the country. Fundamentally, if you, if you 
what are you complaining about um, when you uh, when you rebel? You're saying that these people are not fulfilling their rights, that these people are morally, they have moral weaknesses and, and lapses which are affecting you. But if you then morally compromise yourself and the rebels, if they morally compromise themselves by rebelling against those who have authority and become the next rulers, then they've just become a carbon copy of the people that came before them. And so they, they perpetuate the problem. Yeah. And generally, they tend to be worse. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. this is a fundamental lesson which the Muslim world in particular needs to learn is that rebellion is not allowed. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him himself, said that love of your country is part of your faith. So how can we say that, you know, you're allowed to rebel against your country? He said it's part of your faith. It's part of what makes who you, who you are as a good Muslim. Is to love your neighbours and your immediate neighbours are those in your, the citizens in your country. Yeah. So this is a, an extremely important lesson. Yeah. That needs to be uh, that needs to be learnt, and unfortunately, I think the Muslims are learning it the hard way. Yeah. If they do take any anything out of it. So, what are the qualities that Islam teaches about, uh, which which make up a good leader? Okay, so I think the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him was to us um, a great example of uh, spiritual leadership and secular leadership. Um, with regards to his secular and political leadership, he was chosen by the um, tribes of different backgrounds, the pagans, the Jews, and the Muslims, of course. Um, to be the leader of Medina at the time. So he governed with the consent of the masses. Yeah. And uh, one extremely important thing that he did is that he allowed people to be judged by the identity that they chose for themselves. Yeah. Meaning that the Muslims were judged by the Muslim law, so the Jews would be judged by the Jewish law, and the pagans would be judged by their own pagan common law. Yeah. Um, and today, where religion is, where society is not divided upon such sharp religious lines and religious identities, that same principle of self-determination and self-identification would be, would be implemented by essentially supporting a common law for a nation. Yeah. And the different citizens of the nations would say, we subscribe to this common law um, that we want to be judged by. That's called democracy. Yeah, that was the principle which the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him practiced back then, 1400 years ago yeah. in Medina, when he said that the different people would be judged according to the law that they wanted. So that's a very important point. Another very important, um, I think, leader from early Islam was um, the Caliph Umar. The peace. second Caliph of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Yeah, peace be upon him. Um, what he did, which was, you know, going back to what, Hazrat, uh, to, to what the Prophet Adam, peace be upon him, said, is that he tried to do his absolute utmost to ensure that everyone was food, had food, water, shelter and clothing as a, as a basis. Yeah. And he took immense responsibility upon himself to make sure that this was discharged. Yeah. So one of the things he did was he, he, he did the census of Medina which is said to be the first sort of major census in, in human history, where he went through and he said, who are the citizens of, of our state? Um, how much you know, money, are, are they, are, do they have the money and food that they need? What are their requirements? What are their demands? Okay. And when he did that, he found that there were lapses in these areas and he took funds and, he, and, took wa- and food and water, etc., and applied them to that. Yeah. And he always stands out in the eyes of Muslims. And, and non-Muslims and, yeah, as well. And I think uh, a lot commentators of, yeah. outside of the Muslim world have, have written on him extensively. I mean, Michael J. Hart included him in his list of the 100 most influential human beings on earth. Yeah. Um, for this very reason. Yeah, because he always stands out as an example um, from early Islam, judged you know, wonderfully by uh, both Muslims and non-Muslims, because of the degree of personal responsibility that he took. Because he, he realised, in, in accordance to the teachings of Islam, that uh, authority and, go- and governance is a responsibility. It's actually a burden. It's not some kind of um, you know, birthright. It's not something to be enjoyed. It's something to be uh, you know, run away from, if possible, and discharged as fully as possible um, when you have it. The Caliph Umar's um, humility and responsibility was such that he, he was reported to have said on his deathbed, the prayer that he used was that he did not want to be rewarded for any of his good deeds, he only wanted not to be punished for his sins and for his uh, lapses that he perceived in his authority. And there's a great story from early Islam um, that he used to basically go out at night in disguise so that people wouldn't know that that's the kind of walking around and inspect and inspect around the city and see whether people are having their rights protected, see whether people have enough food, water, etc. And once he, he came across um, a woman who was trying to uh, cook a meal she was pretending that she had food uh, in order to satisfy her children. And she did this until they fell asleep. And while she was doing this, because she didn't have any food, she was complaining about the Califumra. And he heard this and he was um, stricken with grief. And he said to him, and he said to himself, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to be the caliph and I cannot provide for this woman. So he went back to the uh, treasury of the Muslim state and he put a bag of basically got a bag of food and, and whatever the lady needed. And he put it on his back and he himself went 
to that lady in order to give her what she needed. And his, and his servant and his servant said, you know, I, I should, can I carry this for you as a caliph? And he said, um, you can carry this burden for me now, but who will carry my burden on the day of judgment? So this shows the level of responsibility and um, the good leadership that was evident among the early Muslims, which um, I think slowly waned over, over the course of Islam and it's completely evaporated today. Except for, I think, I mean, who, who would you say has this sense of responsibility? Well, the, in the, world? the Khalifa, the Caliph of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. He's one who, you know, he's a spiritual leader. He's not a political leader, but nevertheless, he is, he has worked tirelessly, you know, throughout his life for the good of humanity. And a great indication as to his level of dedication service is the fact that even before he was a Khalifa, he spent 10 years in Ghana, mm. right? In some of the most remote villages of Ghana, promoting education as the headmaster of schools there. Mm. And he was among the first people and he was the first person to cultivate wheat in Ghana. And this shows a person who actually, he lived there for 10 years and he said himself that, you know, um, I regarded Ghana as my home and I did not conceive that I would ever leave Ghana. Yeah. Right. And from Pakistan. And he was from Pakistan. He's not an African, he's not African. He adopted Ghana as his home purely for the sake of the service of their people. And he was also another um, wonderful example of what we've been talking about in respect to um, not rebelling against the state. This was a man, his name is His, his Holiness, Mirza Musfur Ahmed, who was um, imprisoned for his faith. He, yeah. he went to prison for a few weeks yeah. and he, he still remained humble throughout it, he remained cheerful throughout it and he came out cheerful and humble and he still supports the fact that you have to obey um, the, the rule of law in your country. Yeah. Um, and why was he put in prison? Because Pakistan's blasphemy laws would prevent Ahmadis from practicing their faith. And so for unbelievably unjust reasons he was in prison and yet he remained cheerful and steadfast in the face of that. So we have an un incredible contrast between... Um, the, the time of the Prophet Muhammad and the steadfastness he showed, the, the, the fact that he hugely respected freedom of conscience, yeah. uh, freedom of self-determination. He himself, when Muslims were being persecuted, said, go to this Christian king, you'll be able to practice your faith freely there. Yeah. And now we have so-called Muslim states that are in, inflicting these blasphemy laws amongst their own people, uh, you know, even within their religion, let alone outside of their religion. And the Ahmadiyya Muslim community is demonstrating how Muslims should respond. Because among all the Muslim communities in the world, the ones who are some of the most persecuted, probably the most persecuted, not only by sporadic terrorists, but also by actual state-enacted laws, mm. is the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. Right? And, yet, the... and, yet, and yet there's not a single instance of terrorism, not a single instance of extremism, not a single instance of rebellion against the government. Mm. Instead, Ahmadiyya Muslims have persevered in Pakistan and in Indonesia and Arab countries uh, with their faith. And if they found it intolerable, they have left the country. And this is encapsulated in the verse of the, a verse of the Quran, in which uh, human beings will complain on the day of judgment. According to God, God says they will complain on the day of judgment that we were considered as weak in the land. That's why we, didn't, we, we gave up our faith. We gave mm. up our religion. And God will say, was not my earth vast enough for you to migrate therein? Mm. Right? And I know it's diff difficult to migrate and to take up that burden, but following the, teachings of, it happens. following the teachings of Islam are, for a Muslim, they should be the most important things. All right, so that's uh, that's our episode on politics. The next one is going to be on economics. Make sure you subscribe to Believe You Me, and uh, you can't actually do that. What you have to subscribe is to Rational Religion. I'd also recommend you check out our new podcast series, um, which we'll put in the uh, links below. To be honest, it's just the audio of our YouTube videos, but uh, it's an easier way to um, to digest uh, content for for lots of you, I imagine. And we're also going to put a few links uh, in the description box below. In the description box below including a link to a video introducing the Caliph of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community um, in case you want to find out more about him. So until next time, thank you for watching and peace be upon you. Peace be on you.